Okay, so this is the end of the Qing Dynasty is what we're coming into. The Taiping Rebellion is over, and we're moving in that direction. And it's a period of time which has been um, full of rebellions. We did some assignments on that. We talked about the Nian Rebellion and those little rebellions as well as the Taiping Rebellion. There have been the Opium Wars. There's a war with Japan, a war with the French that are also going to happen. And there's some major changes in China itself. And so that's kind of what characterizes this. Um, this is an actual Qing Dynasty flag right here. It's faded. It would be brighter yellow if it was new, um, but the dragon chasing the sun. This is a picture of the last emperor of the Qing dynasty, um, Pu Yi. We'll get to him. Um, so we saw rebellions are really the key from 1850 almost until the end of the Qing dynasty, but definitely until 1878. Um, the big one being the Taiping Rebellion, the second be biggest being the Nian Rebellion. Had we been actually in class, we would have taken a couple of days and done an assignment on minorities in China. We talk about how China is over 90% Han Chinese, um, but 10% of China, almost 10%, are actually minorities that are not Han Chinese, people like the Hakka. Now, if you do the numbers really quickly, China has 1.7 billion people, right? So that 10% is actually 170 million people who are not Han Chinese. That's half the population of the U.S. almost, so that's a lot of people worth considering. Rebellions, we've talked about rebellions a lot. Let's focus one little thing on the Taiping. You know about the Taiping Rebellion. We don't need to go into a lot of detail. But what we do want to emphasize is why it is different from other rebellions that we've looked at. Um, other rebellions are kind of like, yeah, we're mad, we're angry peasants, we hate the Qing, they're terrible, let's get rid of them and let's get a new emperor and we'll make this guy the emperor. Um, the Taiping were different because they didn't say, oh, the Qing are terrible. They said everything is terrible. Let's reinvent China. Let's start over. And they almost won when they did it. Nothing was sacred to the Qing. I mean, they were talking about getting rid of Confucius, getting rid of the exam system, or changing it and having uh, Hong Xiuquan's crazy ideas be the material that you had to test on instead. But they're significant because they almost won. Now, I showed you this before on another assignment when we were talking about the beginning of the Taiping Rebellion, but I cut off the bottom part of the page here. So let's take a look. Um, what we have in this column is arable land. Arable land means land that can be used to grow crops. What we have here is the population of the whole country of China. And then here we have how much land per person is available. And we talked about how in the, a lot of Chinese history, you had about seven mu, which is not quite an acre, 0.15 acres, available per person, right? And we talked about how that number got tighter and tighter. Um, now let's talk about the time frame here, 1812, this would be, you know, just about, we're getting into opium war times. 1820, Hong Xiuquan, he would have been a kid at this time. And 1850 is when the Taiping Rebellion starts. So at the time it was starting, we saw that the land per person was down really low. The whole population, 434 million, was quite high. Now look at what happens historically with the population. So from 1820 to 1850, what happened? Over 30 years, they added 60 million people to the population. From 1812 to 1821, so nine years, they added almost 40 million people. In this period here, what do we have? A 30-year period, and we've added about 50 million people. Here we've got not quite a 30-year, 20-year period, and we've got almost 80 million people. So the population grows and grows and grows in China, right? Now, when was the Taiping Rebellion ended? 1860. So 10 years after this big number we see here. Now look at the very last line on the page, 1901. So we're looking 41 years after the end of the Taiping, after the Taiping were defeated. 41 years later, um, look at the population, 426 million. It's lower than it was when the Taiping started. So even 40 years later, the population had not recovered yet. Hadn't even gotten up to the point where it was, much less grown. So that shows you a little bit of how devastating the Taiping Rebellion was for China in general. Um, it took years and years after this, decades after this, before the population really started to look like it would have without the Taiping to start to grow. So there was a lot of death. And it wasn't just the people that were lost in the immediate fighting. And it wasn't just the people that were killed by the Qing when they went through and cleaned up the cities and villages and provinces that had supported the Taiping. It was also the people who didn't go on and have lives, who didn't have families, who didn't have kids and grandkids. It was the farms that never grew food. So it was the people that starved because there wasn't food available for them. The, this war was absolutely devastating and the impacts are felt for a long, long time.
Okay, we'll get to another assignment here on self-strengthening in just a moment, but I want to give you a quick rundown on So Shi. So she is, as you read in yesterday's assignment, she's a concubine originally of the emperor and actually stages a coup. We'll read more about her tomorrow, but she puts her son in as emperor and then puts her nephew in instead as emperor. But the whole time she's pulling all the strings. She becomes basically the empress. They don't call her empress so she. The word dowager means that you are taking those reins of power for somebody else um, until they're ready. So when it was her adopted son, this was just a child, right? When it was her nephew, this was just a kid as well. So she's admitting, I'm not the empress, but I'm going to act as though I'm the empress until the emperor is ready. Um, just to look, you might be wondering about her fingers. There was a Chinese tradition that it was good luck to grow out your pinky fingernail as long as possible. Some people still do this, but not very many. It's kind of gross when you do see it. Um, so these are likely her real nails, the long, nasty ones, right? Um, this one right here might be her actual nail, but I'm, I'm doubting it. They also had jewelry that it looked like those witch's fingers you get on Halloween that have the fake fingernail on the end. It was kind of like that, but it would be made out of gold and silver, sometimes jade fingernail on there. So this was jewelry that she would slip on because it looked all regal and elegant. You might wonder, well, how would you get anything done if you had that stuff on your hands? It was actually a sign of nobility that you weren't doing hard labor and stuff if you had hands like that. Clearly, somebody else did that work for you. That's actual photograph of her, by the way. It's been colorized. It would have been a black and white photo. This is not her. This is an actress that played her in a movie. I just thought this gives you a good feel for what it would have been like in color as well. Okay, this is... You know, this might be an ink print, actually, but there's an actual photograph of her in her younger years. This is either the photograph or it's a very close copy. Um, this is an official portrait that hung in the palace that was a copy of the painting, uh, the picture. It was done in black and white, so they did one in color for her, but this was done by an artist. Some official court work, and this would have been the adopted son when back when she was just a concubine. So this piece of art dates from before... She staged a coup, got rid of the emperor, and put this dude in there. Here she is later in life. Um, she would have had bound feet. So if you look on the left, see those little things? Those are not her shoes, but those are little stools that she would have put her feet up onto when she was sitting on her throne. Um, she was known for having very painful feet as a result of the foot binding process. Um, here she is late in life. Remember the story in the Tang and Song dynasty about how rich people would go out and go on long trips throughout the countryside and find cool rocks and take them home? These were cool rocks that people had taken back to the palace gardens. There she is being carried around. Okay, so I'm going to go for a podcast for the next little bit here, and that will have a reading from China History by Harold Tanner. It's got some good summary on what this self-strengthening movement is all about. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Once I figure out how to stop this thing without you guys all watching. <laughs> 